started. Um, today is uh, lesson four. We're going to start off with reading uh, Psalm 19, 7 through 14. Welcome, Timmy. And I did these in um, ESV version to start with. So, Nathaniel, if you would like to drop in Psalm 19, 7 through, uh, that would be awesome. So, we're doing Psalm 19, 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Thank you, Nathaniel. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to break it apart, but the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And then we have Psalm uh, 118. We're going 89 through 96. And again, you'll need to break it. It's not that long, though. So, Psalm 119, 89 through 96. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day. For all things are your servants. I don't know what happened, why it didn't pop up. Uh, Psalms, isn't it going to... No, no, you did it right. I don't know why that didn't pop in. Uh, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but by, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. And that was Psalm 119, 89 through 96. I don't, oh, you did 118. Did I say 118? I wonder why that didn't work. It was Psalm 118 that you typed in, but you needed to type in Psalm 119. So, all right. So that's uh, the two uh, things, uh, or two uh, scriptures we read before we get the Bible study going. So we will pray. James, are you up for praying, or you um, got no audio? I'm going to assume. Did I say, if I said 118, my fault, brother. I'm sorry. It was 119, 89 through 96. You can probably catch up. No audio. All right, we'll go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful uh, for your word. We're grateful to be able to gather here today, and we're thankful for you providing clear uh, revelation to us that we might know you and that you have accurately and reliably preserved your word and communicated your word to us, that we might uh, read it and we might uh, be sanctified through it, and we might know you and also be able to teach others who you are uh, through your word. We pray today, Lord, that you would help us to have an open uh, open mind, open hearts to this teaching, and that we would uh, walk away from it uh, with a stronger understanding of how you have preserved your word and how we can be confident as Christians standing on the truth of your word. And may you be glorified through all of this. 
We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Okay. We are on, we are starting lesson four, inerrancy and preservation. We are dividing this into part one and two, and we're dealing with inerrancy uh, this time around. And I just want to take a minute and just say how awesome it is to see James here. Like, this is, this is a blessing for me, guys. For those who don't know, uh, James was supposed to be dead about three months ago as far as everything was looking. And he's been in a medical coma for three months. He got out, uh, I think it's been the three weeks now. And look, at he's already back. He's here with us. And it is a complete blessing to see my brother here. And I am just grateful to God. Thank you, Lord. All right, here we go. We are talking about um, inerrancy of the Bible. So in review, we have talked about inspiration. And we have talked about uh, how there is the doctrine of inspiration. We have talked about what the Bible has says about itself. And does scripture give evidence that it is in fact divinely inspired? It is also very important to establish uh, the inspiration of scripture, both from testimony of scripture itself, as well as from outside scripture. Because it really doesn't matter if it is preserved for us accurately or faithfully or not if the if it's not the word of god it it doesn't matter guys you can debate this stuff all day long if it's not in fact the word of god it doesn't matter we're making the case of course that it is but just to make that clear uh that first has a space missing roger that so if uh it's if it's not the Word of God, then we shouldn't care if it contains errors or corruptions. But if it is the Word of God, then by logical necessity, it would be inerrant and in that God would preserve it for us. We are looking at how these doctrines all tie together now. This is going to be a fun one, guys, because we're, we're, we've done a lot of ground laying the last couple of, um, uh, of these classes. And it, they were pretty like... Cerebral, here's where the rubber meets the road. We're going to tie all these doctrines together, and you're exactly right. Uh, Balaam's donkey, it is the Word of God. Amen, amen. There are two things that must necessarily follow from the doctrine of inspiration. That is why we began with that... What happened there? Come on, Matt. That is why we began with that doctrine, the doctrine of inspiration. And I think I lost my audio. Can you guys hear me? No, I still got audio. There we go. Hopefully somebody give me a woohoo if you can hear me. Yes, okay, thank you, Luke. Okay, so that is why, excellent. That is why we began with that doctrine. If it is inspired and God breathed that God has given us his word to us, the Bible must therefore be inerrant. God must and will preserve his word. If it is God-breathed, then it must be inerrant. This is, this is so important for us to understand. And if it's God-breathed, then God must preserve it. He delivered it to us inerrantly, and then he must preserve it through the centuries so that we can, we can rely on it today. All three of these doctrines, the doctrine of inspiration, the doctrine of inerrancy, and the doctrine of preservation all work together. These are three truths that tie together. And this is something that Pastor Jim said, and I want to quote it for you. He said, I believe all three of these spiritual, uh, all three of these are spiritual instincts of the child of God. We know, expect, and believe these things as Christians instinctively. We understand that it is God's word, and he has delivered it to us. He has preserved it to us. We who have been born again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that we have trusted in the truth, we have obeyed the truth, and we have heard the word of God preached. And when we are regenerate and our hearts and minds are renewed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I think it is a spiritual instinct 
that God's word is true and inspired. We know this intuitively. This is something that Christians have to be educated out of. And I want to say that again because I like heard him say that the first time. I'm like, what is he talking about? When we are first saved, we know that this is God's word. We know to trust it. And for, for, for you to stop doing that, you have to be educated out of it. It's not something that happens naturally. We know this instinctively, intuitively, that the Bible is the word of God, and it is the word of God without error. And we know intuitively that if it is the word of God and without error, then God has in fact preserved it. If God is able to give it to us, he's able to preserve it. I believe this to be true as well. Now, this is that was Jim's quote. This is me saying personally, I believe this to be true as well. I believe God's word is true intuitively. It's a, it's just, I know it. It's a Christian um, blessing from the Holy Spirit. I, I think it would be a way to describe that. Now, this is something that the real child of God has. To deny these three doctrines is something that Christians have to be educated into doing by liberal seminary or such liberal teachings. So what's that mean? If we start out as a new believer in Christ, we are in fact dwelled by the Holy Spirit, we're going to know that this is the Word of God. If later on we change that perspective, it's because somebody has taught us to doubt that through some sort of a liberal seminary or online teaching or something like that. Uh, there is lot therein lies the problem with secular universities and same universities that claim to be Christian. Yeah, and I think that's what Jim was talking about. Is um, we're talking about universities where they claim to be seminaries, but in fact they've gone off the deep end and they're preaching um, false doctrine. Okay, so here's what we're going to talk about. There's going to be three main points in here. We're going to talk about how inerrancy is a biblical necessity and then we're going to talk about how inerrancy is a stand by i want to make sure i highlight it logical necessity and then we're going to talk about how biblical inerrancy is a historical necessity three different necessities biblical logical and historical inerrancy is a natural conclusion to the Bible's teaching on inspiration. Two propositions and a conclusion for you. This is a logical syllogism. And I learned that today. Logical syllogism. There are two propositions and a conclusion. Here we go. Proposition number one. God has spoken. Fairly straightforward. God has spoken. Proposition number two. God cannot lie or error conclusion therefore the bible what god has spoken is without error you guys follow with me there proposition one god has spoken proposition number two god cannot lie or error so therefore we can draw the conclusion that the bible what god has spoken is without error we have already reasonably established Proposition 1. Now we've talked over Proposition 2. And if you have any questions about that, I'll read it again for you. Does anybody have any questions? This is an interactive class. So if you have questions, let me know. All right. Nope. All right. The Bible teaches that God cannot lie. And Nathaniel, if you're ready, I'm going to be dropping some references here. Numbers 23, 19. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has God spoken, and will he not make it good? If anybody else wants to drop the references in, I don't know where Nathan... Nathan oh, there's Nathan. Uh, you got to do a, a colon, not a, not a semicolon. All right, 1 Samuel 5, 20, or sorry, 1 Samuel 15, 29. 1 Samuel 15, 29. Also, the glory of God will not lie. 
or change his mind. For he is not a man that he should change his mind. This was interesting because Jim kind of broke this um, down a little further. He said, the concept of lying is uniquely a human quality. It is not an attribute of God. Just think about that for a minute. The concept of lying is uniquely human. And I assume also to be able to say angelic uh, for the demonic because uh, Satan is a liar and has been from the start. Anything that comes out of his mouth is lie. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his native uh, language. So um, it is a quality of created beings, I would assume, would be a way to qualify that even further. Now we have Psalms 89.35. Psalms 89. I guess it's not Psalms. It's Psalm 89.35. Psalm 89.35. Once I have sworn by my holiness... I will not lie to David. And then we have Titus 1-2, Titus 1-2. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ago. So, last one is Hebrews, or not the last one, next one is Hebrews 6 17 through 18 Hebrews 6 17 through 18 in the same way God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his nature interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie we who have been who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope sat, set before us. I love that. We we should be strongly encouraged. This would be another good verse, I would think, for you, Nathaniel, to sort of reflect on that idea of why should we be encouraged? What is our hope in? We should be strongly encouraged. I love that. Then we have 2 Timothy 2:13. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And I've, I've talked about this before, that you may have heard it said, even by Christians, that God can do anything. Is that a true statement? Well, it's not. That's actually a lie. God cannot deny himself. He cannot duplicate himself. He cannot break his word or any of these things. Specifically around lying, though, he cannot lie. And these, the reality of these things are not weaknesses. The fact that God cannot lie is not a weakness. The fact that we can lie actually means there's weakness in us. The fact that he cannot lie is a perfection in him because he can only do that which is true. Amen, Nathaniel. You've just drawn the conclusion. Well done, sir. So, can God make a round square or a square circle or a rock so big he can't lift it? These are ways to try and trip up Christians on our beliefs in the omnipotence of God. Remember, omnipotence is the power. God is all-powerful. Omni, or I guess it's omnipotence would be the right way to say it. Um, he is all-powerful. God can, he has complete power. Now they'll say like, well, so if God is completely powerful, can he create a, a rock that's too big for him to lift? If he can do anything? Can I please go check my basket? Of course, Luke. Um, he cannot violate, God cannot violate the laws of logic because God is the laws of logic. So, of course, he cannot do this because it would be a violation to have a round square. It, 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 that's a, it's an illogical statement. As God cannot lie, and if he has spoken it, he will bring it to pass. 
So that is the end of the first section on um, logical necessity. The second section. The Bible teaches that God's word is truth. The Bible teaches that God's word is true truth. Now we got some references. If you're ready, Nathaniel, here we go. John 17, 17. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. 2 Samuel 7, 28. 2 Samuel 7, 28. Now, O Lord God, you are God, and your, tr your words are truth. And you have promised this good thing to your servant. 2 Samuel 22, 31. 2 Samuel 22, 31. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tested. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Next one is Psalm 12, 6. Psalm 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. If you think about refined seven times, seven is the, the number of perfection. So that means silver that's 100% pure. All right. Psalm 19, 7. Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now remember, guys, when it says the law or the testimony, we're, we're talking about the Bible. This is the entirety of the Bible. There is a, there is a specificity around um, law, the, the law in God's word, but there is a, there's a general statement of the word of God, the Bible, they didn't call it the Bible. They called it the law or the testimony. So that's something important to be thoughtful of. And it says it's perfect. Okay. Um, that was 19.7. The next one is Psalm 19, or I'm sorry, Psalm 18.30. Psalm 18.30. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Now we have Psalm 119, 151. Psalm 119, 151. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Psalm 119, 142. Psalm 119, 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Psalm 119, 140. Psalm 119, 140. Your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. I like that one. 1 Peter 1, 22 through 23. 1 Peter 1, 22 through 23. Since you have in obedience, since, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'll try that again. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls, for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart, for you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. Love that one. We're going to end off on Proverbs 35. Proverbs 35. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Every word of God is tested. By tested, it means it's true. It has been tested and found to be true. Okay, what are we doing here? We're proving out that syllogism that God has spoken, that God cannot err, he cannot lie, he cannot deny himself. He cannot violate his word. He cannot commit any kind of error. And so, if God has spoken and cannot commit any type of any kind of error, then logically follows that the Bible is without error. 
This is a biblical truth and a biblical necessity. Uh, it was Proverbs. It was Proverbs thirty five. I'll type it in for you. Uh, Proverbs thirty. Okay. That was the entirety of the first statement of um, the biblical necessity of the inerrancy of the Bible. Any questions so far? We're moving on to inerrancy as a logical necessity. First one we had was a biblical necessity. Now we have a logical necessity. Inerrancy is the logical result and a necessary result of biblical inspiration. You cannot have a Bible that is erroneous and a God who is not. The character and nature of God is at stake in an inerrancy debate. This is, this is going to sting a little bit. Some Christians are weak and untaught so they might believe this. This is an essential issue for the church to maintain orthodoxy. It is unorthodox to believe or affirm that the Bible has errors in it, or to say that it can err in anything that it says. Those who would deny this doctrine are outside the bounds of orthodoxy. What does orthodoxy mean? It basically means what's what's right, what's true. So I want to be clear on this. You can have Christians who believe there's errors in the Bible, but and and they are saved. It's not a, it's not a question of their salvation, but it does show that they're weak and that they're untaught. And that is um, something to be thoughtful of. Or they they've gone to seminary and been taught error um, for churches however if you if you have if, if you have a church that that you're going to or, or know of that is saying that there's errors in the Bible it's not a Christian church get away from it, it it's acceptable for a Christian especially a Christian who is uh, not being discipled or a new Christian to have questions about if the Bible's true or not when I was first saved I was like is the Bible where it says, you know, seven days, is that seven million years? What, what are we talking about here? Is, is it an allegory to, to evolution? That's the kind of stuff that bounced around in my brain because I had 40 years of walking in the world. It didn't question my, my salvation, however, but it did show that I was, I was not taught. I hadn't educated myself yet on the Word of God. So just be thoughtful of that. If you meet somebody and they're like, oh, no, the Bible's full of errors, but they have a sound testimony, it doesn't mean that... Um, that they're not saved. So uh, Mikey says, can you debate canon canonization without debating inerrancy? You know, it's a good question from the standpoint of, you know, are these the books in the Bible? And we've talked about that already in the previous, um, the previous studies we've done. So, and we're, we're going to talk about it again, specifically in reference to the Roman Catholic Church and the books that they're adding in. But the reality is we can be sure that the 66 books uh, in the Bible that we have today are in fact the Word of God and that there are no more, there are no less, these are it. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with my own family today. I want to make sure I keep concise on here because we got, goodness, there's a lot here. Um, I got a little, uh, I had a lo lo lovely conversation with my kids today. We talked about 1 Corinthians. Is it actually 1 Corinthians? It's actually 2 Corinthians. The first letter that was written we don't have. And my question to them was, if it turned up today, if we dug it up out of the ground, would that be the word of God and would we have to add it to the Bible? And and you should have seen their face. You can understand it's 6, 9, and 11. Um, the 6-year-old, 9-year-old were like, oh, I think so. My daughter, on the other hand, 11, she's she's gone through some more training. She was like, no, no, we have the Bible. So it was pretty cool. All right. To compromise the doctrine of inerrancy is to begin down a very slippery slope. 
If we cannot trust the historical, scientific, testable details of the Bible, then how can we trust the things we cannot verify, namely spiritual truth? We're going to break that down. Uh, one main thing I want to look for is churches that stick to the God's word preaching it and doesn't exaggerate it. Some churches, Evelation being an example of exaggeration in Bethel. Yeah, Bethel and Hillsong are not churches. Yeah, leave those. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, so iron, so one man sharpens... Yeah, my shirt. Thanks. Uh, I was meaning if it was meant to be in the Bible, we would have it already. Exactly. Um, an example of this is someone who seems like they should know, seems like an expert. So this is going to be an example to understand why we why we should trust the Bible and what happens when you start down the slippery slope of saying, well, there might be some errors in it. Think about talking to somebody who's an expert. They seem like an expert in something maybe you're not an expert in, right? Maybe they're maybe they're talking about arc or something like that or about some uh, some game or some technology and they seem like they they're presenting themselves as an expert. But then as they're talking they start making some really silly mistakes. And could you go put some clothes on, dude? We would be grateful. Uh, Luke, would you hook him up with some clothes, please? So, thanks. We appreciate you putting some clothes on. Um, thanks, Luke. Go hook him up with some clothes. Uh, let's see here. Then the things we can test or verify, we should believe it. So, when you think about somebody who's an expert and the stuff that they're saying, all of a sudden, like, most of what they said sounded pretty good. Hey, it's Wyatt! Yay! All right. Some of this, what they're saying sounds pretty good, but then they say something really dumb, really obvious that they, like, completely, it will completely discredit everything else that they've said. And that's the same problem you have with the Bible. If you start saying there's errors in this, it invalidates the rest of it. You can't say some of it's true and some of it's not. It doesn't work. All right. The example is a man begins to talk about a subject. You have no knowledge of. He's waxing eloquent. He begins to speak on a subject. And then you hear him giving some information that you know is factually inaccurate. Do you assume that what he told you concerning about what you could not check is factually accurate? No, you wouldn't. If the Bible is in error historically or scientifically, then on what basis do you trust what it says with things that, that can't be tested, like the areas of spirituality? That's why when Jesus said, and here's one for you, Nathaniel, Jesus said in John 3.12, John 3.12, he said, If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe when I tell you heavenly things? Isn't that a great point, guys? If you don't trust the Bible with earthly things, then how are you going to trust it with heavenly things? Thanks for hooking them up. Appreciate that, Luke. The same applies to Scripture. If we say the Bible got physical things, historical things wrong, then why we, should we say it would have the spiritual things right? Last point is there is no good reason or argument nor proof of contradiction, inaccuracy, which might cause us to doubt the doctrine of inerrancy. Inerrancy as a historical doctrine. Hey, we got Wyatt in the house. Welcome, Wyatt. Yay. Okay. Inerrancy as a historical doctrine. So we had biblical. Last one is logical. This one is historical. This is not a new creation, what we're talking about, inerrancy. It didn't just happen. Not a result of the Reformation. Not something from Luther. This is historic Christianity. It's our orthodox faith, faith, universal affirmation of God of the people of God. This goes logically to God Himself, and this is a quote by Augustine. He said, "I have learned to yield this respect and honor only to the canonical books of Scripture, the sixty-six books." I added that. Of those alone, do I most firmly believe that the authors were completely free from error. And if in these writings I am perplexed by anything which appears 
to me opposed to truth, I do not hesitate to suppose that either the manuscript is faulty or the translator has not caught the meaning of what was said, or I myself have failed to understand it. That's the end of the quote. This should be the default. There is something wrong with me. This is a humble position of the child of God, that they would hum humble themselves and say, there must be something here I don't understand. And so I'm going to study and figure out what it is. What is my blind spot that makes me think there's an error here? This is simply giving the author, human or divine, the benefit of the doubt. We would do this with any other work. I want you to think about this. If you're reading a book, some book you, you find that expert in something, and you read something and it's a, and it's a contradiction in what you're reading, you would assume that the error was made either by somebody who was, who was in charge of the copyright of it, or it was you misunderstood something yourself, and you'd go back and, and double check it. If you do this with, the, with, with human writings, why wouldn't you do that with the Word of God? Now, this is a quote from Luther. The scriptures have never erred. The scriptures cannot err. It is certain that scripture would not contradict itself. It only appears so to the senseless and... <laughs> the word get cut off, but it's hypocrites. Um, I think it was, uh, it was unorthodox hypocrites. Anyways, being a hypocrite. So, um, I couldn't read. It was like a birderate. Illiterate. Maybe it was illiterate. No, that wasn't it either. No, I'll figure it out later. Anyways, what Luther is saying is, if you have a problem with scripture, it's your problem. It's not the problem with scripture. Okay? This has always been the view of the church. This is the spiritual instinct of Christians. And we have um, to be learned out of of this. If you meet a Christian and maybe they're going to a seminary or something like that and they start talking about how well there's all these errors in scripture they were taught by somebody and confused by somebody deliberately to make them believe this uh, falsity. Okay, that was the teaching on it. Now let's talk about the uh, objections. Is this a Bible study? Not technically, Tony. This is a study of the Bible how we can trust it, and how we know it's an error. We do Bible studies too, but to be honest, this is a study of the Bible, not a Bible study. Okay, here's some question, guys. Here's some objections, and I'm sure if you've been a Christian or been out in the world, you've already heard these. Objection number one, to err is human. The Bible was written by humans, therefore the Bible has errors. Okay, what's the problem with this objection? Well, there's, there's a premise here that's wrong. Did you spot it? Was the Bible written by humans? Okay, I was going to say, let me know when we start reading the Bible. Understood completely, Tony, and we do that. We do read the Bible. And in fact, where have you been, dude? We were reading a whole bunch of stuff from the Bible. But the point is, those readings from Scripture were to back up this study of the Bible. And I apologize if, um, if I said Bible study... Um, Luke always likes to correct me and rightly so but right now we're talking about it from this point uh, transcribed by humans not written by humans uh, and, and you're kind of you're going down the right path did Paul write the Bible would you affirm inspiration that God is inspiring Paul to write it take care Tony so it is an incomplete premise regarding scripture the argument is invalid. If there's a premise invalid, then the argument's invalid. All right. And the premise is, to err is human, the Bible was written by humans. The humans were the pen. Okay. They were the mechanism by which the Bible was written. But the Bible was written by God. So that, that uh, invalidates that objection. Here's some of the answers that are also important. 
I'm home now. I'm all ears. I thought you were just off to work. All right. Um, so here's another thing to hear. To err is human. Let's talk about that premise. Do humans always err? Does it follow that just because a human can err, that the Bible necessarily contains errors? Humans also do math equations. Two plus two is four. Does that mean that we always get the wrong answer? Can I please... Luke, just go. You don't have to interrupt. Just go do it. We trust you. Go ahead. Um, where are we at? So, it does not necessarily follow that since humans can error, that the Bible is in error. That's a false premise. Here's another point. God could prevent errors. And we believe that God did prevent errors. Scripture given by God in the original autographs were without error. And God has preserved it as such. Now, are we saying that this Bible right here that I'm holding my hand is completely perfect and without error? No, we're not saying that. We're saying the original autographs. When Paul sat down and penned on a parchment, I'm assuming parchment, uh, penned on parchment, or I guess it would have been, would it have been a parchment? Or would it have been a um, pressed um, uh, palm leaves? There's another word for it. Papyrus. Thank you, epitome. Thank you, papyrus. So when Paul writ on original papyrus, that original writing was without error. Very important. Papyrus or skin? Yeah, parchment skin. I know papyrus is the, the leaf version. So... Those original autographs are without error and preserved by, and it has been, but it has been preserved over, over the centuries by God. We don't believe that the authors were inerrant, that they never made mistakes or that they did not believe that they would do things wrong. They may have done things wrong, but God used them to write his word. He kept them from writing anything that was erroneous or false so that the product the revelation the product from or of the human authorship is inerrant not the author very important thanks for the snapshot very cool all right when they wrote god prevented them from writing any wrong beliefs into what they wrote now Let's turn it around on them. If somebody says this, well, to err is human, so the Bible must have errors in it. Turn it around on them and say, well, if to err is human, then I can't believe anything you're about to say either. So your objections all fail because you're committing an error because you're human. It's a logical error in that. Okay. Objection number two. We only believe that the original autographs were inerrant. We cannot produce them or check our modern translations by the original. Therefore, we have no confidence what, what we have today is inerrant. Answer. We are going to get into this more in the coming weeks ahead, in the other lessons we're going to do, as we look at how do we know that what we have in the manuscripts today properly reflects the originals. The question becomes one of manuscript analysis. Can we look at what we have and reconstruct the original text reliably? In short answer, yes, yes we can. We don't need to see the original to know that what we have is accurate. You'll see this and we'll explain this in a couple weeks. We'll actually even do an example of it. They have an example in the teaching about doing a cookie recipe. I think we're going to change it to doing a, um, a kibble recipe. But we'll see how that works out. This is a key thing for you guys to understand. Just because all we have today is copies with errors in it, that does not mean that we can't know what the original was. If you take all the copies and put them side by side, we can get back to what was originally written with 100% accuracy. 
we do not need the original to know what was originally written. And that's a very important premise. We do not need the original papyrus to know what was originally written because we have all of these copies. And I'll tell you right now, we talk about this later on, but I think it's fascinating. It's actually a good thing we don't have just one original. It's good that we have all these copies. Because we have all these copies, we know what the original is and it can't be fabricated. If we had a single document that was the original one that Paul penned on, then it could be um, falsified. It could be changed and we would have no way to determine that because they modified the original. And if, and if you think about it, anybody who's a tech, technophobe like I am, this is actually a fundamental premises of blockchain technology that they're basing all of the uh, cryptocurrencies on. Blockchain is everybody has a copy, so we know if somebody messes with it. We know what the original is from all the copies. Well, guess where they got the idea from? The Bible. All right, last objection. Objection number three. We know we have certain errors in certain manuscripts that we possess today. Apparently, there's errors in John 8 and there's errors in Mark uh, 16. They're called textual variants. Therefore, the originals contained errors. That's the objection. This answer assumes another part of our argument to be true, that our copies contain the original. The condition of the original copies, I'm sorry, the condition of the copies does not reflect at all upon the condition of the original. There are some sections in John and Mark that have variances, and we will study these later. We know that we have the passages that were added in. And the point is that we know that they were added. The presence of variations, changes, errors in translation, transcription, does not mean that there are errors in the original. Inerrancy only applies to the original autographs. All these objections are double-edged swords. Just as you cannot prove the originals were without error, we don't have them, so you cannot prove that they contained errors. If you don't have the originals, then you can't prove they have errors for the very same reason. We simply have no reason to believe that what we have today is any different from what was originally written. The presence of transcription errors doesn't mean the original had errors. Inerrancy only applies to the original autographs. With the last objection, objection four, uh, I'll introduce you to a new concept. It's related, but it's, but it's related called infallibility. There is an argument that presence of errors shows that we have no idea what the original document said. Then how do you know today that we don't have the exact perfect copy of it today? Because without the original, you can't know that we don't have the original. Objection four. I believe that infallibility refers to truth of scripture statements while inerrancy refers to its facts and history. This is basically trying to tear the Bible kind of apart, all right? Saying, well, we believe this is inerrant, but, but this has problems with it. Um, there may be inerrancies in facts and history, but never in the truth of the statements. Evangelicals who flirted with liberalism in the early church started doing this kind of stuff. For instance, I may affirm that God created the true statement of Scripture without affirming the literal Adam and Eve of a literal garden and a literal 24-hour day. This is a false distinction. Inerrancy and infallibility cannot be separated like that. Infallibility is a stronger word. It includes inerrancy within it. Something cannot be infallible if it is not inerrant. They're mutually exclusive. God is incapable of erring. Something can be inerrant without being infallible, but nothing can be infallible without being inerrant. 
And you might have to think about that for a minute. And somebody might even put that in the text chat for me so that gets locked in. Something, and I'll, maybe I'll type it in. I'll type it in so we have that written in there. Because that's something you, you read it and you're like, what? Something can be inerrant without being infallible. But nothing can be infallible without being inerrant. And those are two, it, it's kind of like talking about God being infinite and our punishes, punishments being eternal. You need an infinite God to pay for eternal punishments. You got to kind of say those a couple of times in your head to get them to get them locked in. And this is one of the ones I would recommend you being thoughtful about. Something can be inerrant without being infallible, but nothing can be infallible without also being inerrant. We would claim that the article or author is infallible. That's wrong. However, if, I'm sorry, we would claim that God, who is the author, is infallible. However, if something is infallible, then it cannot err, and thus, everything that God has written is inerrant. I may make a statement. Um, let's see here. I want to make sure I say this right. I may, I may make a statement that in every respect is wholly factual and without error. But that doesn't make me infallible. Did you guys catch that? I can say something. I can say 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's an inerrant statement. It's, it's perfectly factual. However, that doesn't mean I'm infallible. I can still make mistakes. That's why I tell you guys, go back. Check me against the word of God. You find where I'm messing up against the word of God, you tell me. And I'll, I'll repent of it. Because this is truth. And it's infallible. It's inerrant and it's infallible. And I will always bow to the word of God. If I am infallible, which I'm not, but if I am, then all my statements will be without error. This only applies to God. Because only God is infallible. And if the Bible is his revelation, then it is inerrant because he is infallible. And that concludes the training. Hopefully you guys um, caught the, the importance of understanding that when we hold up God's word, we are holding up a book that he, he wrote. It was penned by men, but he has written it. It is infallible, inerrant, and we can trust it. And he has preserved it. Not men. Men were used by him to preserve it. But he is the one who has supernaturally preserved this as his word, and we can trust it. We will go over textual variants and things like that. Why are there some Bibles that have this passage and other Bibles that don't? We will talk about that in subsequent um, classes. But this one was fundamentally about the original autographs and how we can trust its inerrancy. All right, we got a woo from Wyatt. Okay, any questions? We have about, looks like six minutes left. For the class before we end it. Any questions? We covered a lot of material there, guys. Thank you, because I know that Epitome is here. Appreciate the uh, the clarification. Balaam's Donkey's new. I saw you sign up for Chapter Verse earlier. We had Tony who was here now. Uh, Mikey was asking some good questions. Yeah, transcribed by humans, not written by humans. Well, it was it was technically written, you know, manually written by, by humans. I'm not new. Balaam's donkey. Did you change your name? Your new user chapter verse because I saw you sign up. Uh, I'm looking. Did you change your name from another name? Swamp? Yes, because I changed my new name. What was your old name? Oh, this is John. You guys are keeping me on my toes. All right, I like uh, I like the new name. If God can use the donkey, He can use me, right? I like that. That swamp donkey. Oh, I get it. I see how you're tying it all together. Okay, any other questions, guys? 
and I'll make sure I, I update you in my brain. LOL. Now, do you get do you get the original LOL, the 1K, or are you are you did you get upgraded to the new uh, high definition uh, 8K? You know, animated, awesome. LOL. All right. Anybody have any uh, any questions? We'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you, Nathaniel, for dropping in the scripture references. Really appreciate that. And we're going to end on, uh, I just want to read this scripture one more time so you guys lock it in. This is Jesus Christ, and he's making it clear why we can trust the whole Bible. And he says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? God has told us these things in the Bible. We can trust them. They're, they're verifiable. But if you doubt even the verifiable things in the Bible, then you can't trust any of it. You cannot pick and choose out of this book what you're going to believe. You either take the whole thing or you throw the whole thing in the trash. And if you do, you'll be making the gravest mistake you could possibly make. Because this is, in fact, the Word of God. He delivered it to us so that we may know Him and we can trust it. And this is how the simple... Hello, raise your hand if you're simple. You can become wise by reading this book. And you will never, never be thwarted if you stand firmly on what it teaches. And I'm very, very grateful for that. All right, that finishes our Bible study. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and close out with prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, I am very thankful to see my brother James here. That is a real blessing. I know, Lord, that is an answer to many, many prayers. And I thank you for that. I also thank you for everybody else who has been faithful here to join us. We have covered a lot of information. I pray that you will help them to understand it and apply it. I pray that you will help them to have an increased confidence in your word, that they may stand boldly on it and preach it boldly, and know that they are preaching the inerrant, infallible word of God. And that through it, People are saved, Lord, because you are at work through your word. And I pray that you would help us all, Lord, to be thoughtful and respectful of your word and that we would write it upon our hearts, we would memorize it, we would preach it, and we would love it. And through it, Lord, we would know you more, know your beauty more, and know the work that you have done for us to save us from the wrath that we deserved through the finished work of your Son on that cross. I pray this all in his name, my King and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you have a blessed rest of your day. Amen from Brother James. Yay! I like the other verse there. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Amen, amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. Next class, part two will be next week, same bat time, same bat channel. And there we'll be talking about preservation. 